Microsoft Copilot Studio has a feature called Generative Answers, which allows you to upload documents, put in public websites, and get instant AI-generated answers over those data sources. But there are circumstances where you want more than what you can get out of the box with this low-code experience. And Copilot Studio is a low-code experience, but it is designed to be able to reach through into some of the more sophisticated tools for when you do need to extend. So if, for instance, you want to work with documents in an external repository and you want sophisticated search, or you want to connect to a database somewhere else, and again, you want that really sophisticated search rather than just a single point of retrieval, then one of the things you can do is to connect as your OpenAI on your data and bring it in. And I'm going to take you through step by step how to do that and what you get out of it. This is a great slide that Microsoft have provided as part of the Copilot Studio implementation guidance. I'll pop the link in the description for that full pack. This is taking you through the way that it works with the low code tools where you can connect to public data, SharePoint, uploaded documents and custom data. And this is the piece that I'm now gonna go through. So you'll see here that when you bring that as your open AI on your data, you've got a lot of other things with those more sophisticated AI types Type of search tools, things like vector search and semantic search, which can go much deeper and give you much more accurate results. So this is a use case for those really large, complex type of data sets. And what I'm going to go through in the demo here first is connecting up a database. I'm actually going to use a sample database. So if you want to follow along with this, you can do exactly the same thing. Then what I'm going to do is bring in Azure AI search to create an index over that data and talk about some of those indexing options. From there, we're also going to have a resource for Azure OpenAI where we can bring the latest and greatest <laughs> GPT models across working with our data here. And then finally, we're going to bring all of that back into the Copilot Studio experience. So this is this nice blending of starting with a low code tool, going deeper into other things and bringing it back in there so that you can have that handoff and not have to start again. So I'm here in my Azure portal. I've got some resources that I've already got spun up here. I've got my AI search, Azure AI search resource and I have also got a Azure OpenAI resource in there as well. Let's first take a look at the search resource and what we want to do here is to bring our data into it and index it using that more sophisticated search functionality. So we'll come up here and say import data and you'll see that you've got a lot of different data sources here that you can choose from depending on where your data is including some preview things there with SharePoint Online which I will try in another video. For now I'm just going to choose the sample data set and you'll see that we've got a real estate sample set and a hotel sample set. I'm just going to work with the hotel sample set here. You've got options to bring other sophisticated search and AI tools in here as well. So we've got enrichments. If you want to be using things like extracting people's names and entity extraction feature or location names, we've got detecting languages, translations, key phrases. So all of these things you can use in combination. This is all much more sophisticated than just simply pointing at a SharePoint site and being done. I'm going to skip all of those for now. What happens is I get my database showing up here with all of the things that are going on. So you'll see that I've got a database here with multiple tables in it. It's got the hotels in there. We will scroll down a bit and you'll see that we've got other tables. So we've got a table with the hotels has related rooms and all of those things are in there as well. We can just have a look at the full list there. And then each one, we have got a checkbox in here of whether it is going to be indexed, whether it's going to be part of the search so you can go through and set all that up to be the way that you want. Once you're satisfied with that, we're creating an indexer. Now, because I'm working on a sample data set here, I can't have it automatically updating, but with your real data set, you can set up that schedule for being able to have the data updated into the index. All right, I think we are good to go. Let's click submit on there. We get a notification here saying that the index was successfully created. Always love a success message. And now when I come back in, we can have a look at the indexes on the side here and see that that's come through and that's successful. There's 50 rows in that table and we are 
ready to go. Now, if you want to work with more sophisticated searching tools, you've got things in here around working with semantic search again, I'm trying to give you an overview of getting started with this. We'll go deeper into those things. If you're interested, let me know. I can make some more content on this. This is all very new for all of us learning all of this stuff. All right, now we're switching across into the Azure OpenAI Studio. No more dark mode, I'm afraid. So what we've got here is the ability to deploy whatever language model we want to work with. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a new deployment, and then we're going to use that deployment of an AI model over the top of that indexed data that we just created and bring all those things back together. So I've got no deployments in here at the moment. We're just going to click here to create a new deployment. I will select the model. Now, what you have access to here is going to depend on what geographic region you're in. I'm building this in an Australia East geography. I've got access to the latest and greatest here. I'm going straight for the GPT-432 in there. There are different costs as well. So you do need to weigh up the cost of these models against your use case. If you've got really complex high value use cases some of those models are going to be worth paying for others you will get just as good a result with some of the other models so it is worth understanding that as well we give the deployment a name and click create and then again a success message <laughs> excellent all right from here what we're going to do is test it out so I'm going to go over into my chat playground here and see what happens so this is giving me an experience of testing things I haven't yet connected up the data this is just my GPT-4 turbo model so we'll show you what it can do and then I'll show you the difference when it's connected to the data and this is a core concept here of being able to augment your language model. You don't necessarily have to do custom models. You can augment that with your data and have a much more close experience to what you want to do. So let's come in here and pop in a query. I'm going to New York for three days. Lucky me, my budget is $300 a night. I need something that sleeps three people. I would like to be near the major tourist attractions and we'll click send. Now this is just using the GPT-4 language model. This is just predictive. It's actually just going through and putting things in. You'll see, you can spot straight away. I'm recording this February 2024. Thankfully, please make sure to check the hotel's COVID protocols. Not top of mind anymore. So this is not currently scouring the internet and finding things. This is just a predictive language model giving us the answers, but we want to do better than this. We want to connect it up to the data source. So let's do that and see what difference it makes. So over here, add your data. And now we're going to bring in that indexed data that we did in the first part here. So I'm going to click here and say, let's add a data source. I can choose from any of these things. I've already built all of that in the first part in that Azure AI search. We can come in here and choose the search service. So that was the one that I built it on. And then I can choose my Azure AI search index. And that's the index that we created earlier. You do need to acknowledge that this is going to start costing you money. Please make sure you check your costs when you do this and have all of the right alerts set up. From here, we're going to map the data into what we did in the index into here so it knows what it's working with. So where is our content? It's actually in the description and category fields. The file name is the hotel ID. The title is the hotel name. And I actually don't have a URL in this data set. So we'll click next. And then we've got the different search types. I've only got basic keyword search set up here. But if you've gone into those more sophisticated tools of using the semantic search, then you'd be able to select that from here. So we will click next. We get a nice confirmation message. Save and close. All right, let's see what difference this makes. So we saw what happened before. Let's clear the chat, start again with a whole new conversation. We'll pop the same question in here and see what we get that's different. So straight away, very different answer. We're going to work on the friendliness of this in a moment. And there is one reference in here. So this is how we can tell now that it's actually connecting to that data source and not just making stuff up. It's actually connecting. So this is a really good way of mitigating against that sort of hallucination, but also having now that GPT-4 model augmented with our data. But I didn't have to train a custom model. I'm just adding it, I'm giving it extra things. What we can do here is if I click through on that, it's actually giving me the reference. So all of these tools that give you these citations can also just really help the user validate that they're getting the right information. 
want to give this some personality though. And this idea of adding a system prompt is another core concept of how you can get the most out of your AI experience. So we'll click over here onto the prompt and you'll see the system message here. You are an AI assistant that helps people find information. I mean, sure, let's do better than that. You are a travel agent who is expert in finding hotels and tourist attractions that match what your clients are looking for. Your tone is friendly, helpful, and chatty. Now you can actually go quite deep here and the more information you're putting in, this concept of asking the AI to act as a certain type of persona can completely change the experience you get and is another really good way of getting better results than just typing something in. We will apply those changes, update the system message in there, and now let's give it another go and see what happens. So we'll pop that in there. Look at that. Look how different this is now. So what we've got, oh, New York, the city that never sleeps. So now we're getting that kind of chatty, enthusiastic persona that we gave it. We are still getting the reference. We have got some references in here to going seeing things on Broadway, which honestly is one of my favorite things to do. Just before we go any further, let's have a look at some of these configuration options. So you can see that we've got the GPT-4 model in here. If I go into the parameters, we've got different things. So again, with the low code experience, you don't have control over this. As we go into these, Azure AI tools, I've got control over things like, for instance, temperature, which sitting at zero means it's very accurate. It's very deterministic. We know what we're going to get out of it. Whereas if I slide that up to the top, which is one, it gets very creative. So depending on your use case here, 0.7 is usually the default for most of these things. But given that it's connected to data, it's defaulted right down to kind of a be less creative. That also means that you will get the same answer every time. Whereas if you slide that scale up, you're going to get a, a more creative and a different answer each time. Let's ask it one more thing because it's suggested I'll be right in the heart of Broadway. I am interested in that. What Broadway shows should I see on Valentine's Day? I'm sorry, but I can't provide real time information. So what we've got here, the really sophisticated language model connected to our data, but it's not connected to the internet yet, so it can't get that current data. We're going to mix that up and bring that in in the next step. So what I'm going to do now is take this model. So I've got a combination here of the large language model, the data indexed through the Azure AI search with any of those other sophisticated things that I wanted to do. And I'm just going to push that back into my low code app experience. So we're going to go here, deploy to a new Microsoft Copilot Studio Copilot. You, depending on when you're doing this, you might still see some old names. Power Virtual Agents is what that used to be called. Don't worry about that. It might have changed by the time you watch this. Now, this comes up in a new Copilot experience, and it's asking you to give a Copilot a name. You will see here, welcome to Microsoft Copilot Studio. Name your new bot to connect your Azure OpenAI resource. That's what you want to see. At the time of recording, this is only in US environments, but hopefully coming to other geographies near you soon. Copilot name. We're going to come in here and put in the name of the Copilot. It's only working in English again at the time of recording, and I click Create. We give it a second. The bot will deploy in the background. And once that's done, we get those lovely success messages that we like so much. So what we're going to do now is see what this has done. Let's have a look at the plumbing. So I'm going to come over here, have a look at my topics and plugins. So these are all of the topics. You can actually use Copilot Studio to create specific topics as we go through and say, you know, if the user asks these types of things, take them down this conversational path. We've also got in here this system topic, which is this conversational boosting topic where this has gone. This is sitting here as, as unknown intent. So at the moment, my copilot is just a, this is all it's doing. I haven't created any other topics, but I could have something around travel. I might have something else that I want people to ask. So depending on your use case, you could actually have a conversational thread and then you bring this in as part of that or this could just be effectively a fallback or, or the entirety of the copilot is just to connect to that. You've got choices in there. So what we have got here is that we are using generative answers on this data source here. So if I open this, you'll see that we've got the Azure OpenAI. Let's have a look at the properties for that. And these are the properties that came through from where we set it up. You can actually change this in here now if you want to, because we've got that model available to us and all of those other values that we had in there around the index and what it was mapped to, including our personality in here. You are a travel agent who is friendly and chatty. That's come across as well. 
all of that is editable in here. One last thing, I'm going to go back into my data sources. I want it to be connected up to be able to see what's going on. We've got a public website in here. So I'm going to put in the broadway.com website and see what it does, because that is now going to point to that. This works best on websites that actually have some information. If your website is largely just sort of marketing text and it's multiple layers. It will only go sort of two layers down in the URL. If you've got something that's largely graphics and navigation, you won't get a good result out of this. But if you've got websites that actually have a lot of substance fairly close to the top, then this is a really good feature to use. Now, you might have noticed up till now that I have actually been working off pre-recorded screenshots, which I don't normally do, but all of those Azure resources, there's costs, there's time to deploy. I just wanted to make sure that all of that was uh, under control. <laughs> I am now in my live co-pilot and I'm giving it the same prompt here. I'm traveling to New York on my own. I enjoy art and theater. Where should I stay and what should I see while I'm there? And this is going to draw on the data source as well as the website that I've put in there. If you like any of this, please give this video a thumbs up. It helps it reach other people. And I really do want to do a lot more content on Copilot Studio. All right. That sounds like an exciting trip. We've got that nice personality coming through here. As for things to see, uh, we've got citations. So I can click on those things and see the information about the hotels. Let's test out what happens with the website here. So we're going to come in here and say, what should I see on Broadway with a six-year-old? And again, it's it's able to determine whether it's going to that data source or whether it's going to the website. You can have multiple websites in there and it's going to find that information. So here we go. We have got Broadway offers a magical world of music. We've got Aladdin, Back to the Future. That's actually a really good one. I did I was lucky enough to get to see that, The Lion King. And if I click on that, it's actually taking me through to that best Broadway shows for kids, which is where it's getting that information from. Let me know what else you would like to learn about Copilot Studio. Thank you very much for watching.